I call this meeting James City County Board of Supervisors Business Meeting to order on June 22nd, 2021 at 1 p.m. Mr. Stevens, would you call the roll, please, sir? Sir, Ms. Sadler? Here. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. Mr. McGlennon? Here. Mr. Hipp? Here. All present. Thank you. All right, next we'll move into presentations. All right, our first is accommodation presentation for Mr. Tom Tingle. How you doing, sir? And Sue's going to lead us off on that Mr. as our Tingle, chair. Mr. Tingle, please join me, sir. As I knock the mic over. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We just wanted to take a moment to recognize Tom Tingle today. He's given countless hours of his time and service to the county. He's brought immense um, expertise to our Economic Development Authority. And we just, he's retiring from his service with us. But we just wanted to take a moment to thank him for the many years of his dedication to James City County. In doing so, we have a prepared commendation that we'd like to present to you, sir. Whereas Mr. Thomas G. Tingle has faithfully served as Director of the Economic Development Authority, the EDA, of James City County, Virginia, with honor, integrity from June 2005 to May 2021, and whereas Mr. Tingle not only served with distinction, but was a great friend to the business, businesses of James City County, providing exemplary service, dedication, and leadership, and whereas Mr. Tingle provided his leadership countless times both as vice chair and chair of the EDA throughout his four terms as an EDA director. And whereas Mr. Tingle represented the EDA on several county initiatives, including the Business Climate Task Force and the Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee. And whereas Mr. Tingle has brought respect, honor, and integrity to James City County, the Office of Economic Development, and the EDA, by leading by example, exhibiting highest level of ethics, and whereas Mr. Tingle was instrumental in supporting multiple accomplishments during his time on the EDA, including the establishment of the Greater Williamsburg Partnership and Launchpad Business Incubator, and whereas Mr. Tingle's unwavering commitment, willingness, and ability to understand and respond to the concerns of the businesses of James City County has made a substantial contribution to the betterment of the county through continued business growth and development. And whereas Mr. Tingle volunteered numerous hours, incurred personal sacrifice, and exhibited outstanding community spirit in his service, acting as an agent of change while maintaining a demeanor that made working with him a pleasure. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I speaking for Mr. Hipple, Chairman of the Board of Supervisors of James City County, Virginia, hereby honor and commend Mr. Thomas G. Tingle for the tremendous service he has given to the community. In witness thereof, I hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of James City County, Virginia to be affixed this 22nd day of June, 2021, be it further resolved that the Board of Supervisors of James City County wishes to express its gratitude and best wishes to Mr. Tingle in his future endeavors. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it all. Thank you very much. Tom. You let me say something? Yes, Please do. Sir. Please, Please do. do. After all those years. <laughs> so I'm not used to standing at this podium. I'm used to standing at the one where I face the board, but just want to say thank you. I can assure you when I joined the EDA in 2005, I did not intend to make a 16-year career of it, <laughs> but I hope that I've been able to help uh, James City County, and it, certainly it's been an honor to serve with this board, the boards before it. And, and I would encourage with my back to the Board of Supervisors to uh, – ask this board to continue to keep economic development uh, in the forefront in your, your planning. Uh, it is extremely important to the county. You've got a great staff. You've got a very talented and diverse group of businessmen and women on the EDA now. So put them to work. Um, I look forward to the results in the coming years. And thank you again. Thank you, thank you Tom.
All right, next, number two, VDOT quarterly report. Mr. Carroll, welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, Chairman Hipple, other distinguished members of the board. Um, here to give the quarterly update for VDOT. Uh, to start off, um, we've had some better weather. This quarter has served well for us in trying to catch up with all the delinquent drainage calls and uh, trying to get our truck ditchers moving and, and getting our excavators going. Um, so it's been a much better a quarter when it comes to that compared to the two quarters prior. So that's that's a good thing for us. So uh, that has been one of our focus points uh, moving forward. So just looking at some of our accomplishments um, from March to the end of May, um, we had completed 781 of 910 work orders uh, in the county, um, <clears throat> which was an 86% completion rate. And of those, um, that were remaining 77 drainage 46 roadway and six vegetation um, so you can still see the drainage is one of the major concerns um, from our customers um, even in the past quarter so you know still focusing on that a few highlights to accomplish um, we did 25 drop inlet repairs and cleaned uh, swept uh, 98 lane miles of roadway route 199 uh, Monticello, Route 60, uh, Section of 607, uh, completed ditching for four miles of roadway, uh, patching road surfaces, 56 tons of asphalt, a lot of that prior to paving schedules coming in, which started this month. Um, so we have a, a very aggressive paving schedule moving forward, so glad to see them getting started a little bit early. Uh, mowing, we did primary and secondary um, mowing and the new, I saw them out here last week doing the litter pickup on 199, but that starts this week as well. Um, so you'll see the mowing for the primary and secondary system. Um, and um, looking on to our projects, uh, we have the I-64 widening segment three. I'm not gonna read all through that, but the completion date is getting closer. Uh, December of this year, so uh, a lot, a lot of, a lot is going on out there, um, and trying to hit those target dates. So, uh, uh, just I will say, as you travel through that work zone, you know, please watch the speed limit, be courteous, and uh, and watch out for the tri the lane switches because we have a lot of lane switches going on out there, um, which causes you know some confusion um, when you're going from one side to the other. So. Uh, another project that's under construction is the Long Hill Widening Project. Um, that's between really 199 and Old Town Road. Uh, that's converting a two-lane road into a, uh, a four-lane road. And um, they're doing a lot of work right there around Devon Road, Old Town Road now. Uh, they're in what they consider stage two. Um, and then we also have, as part of that project, is a rev share um, project uh, that will extend the turn lane and add turn lane at Old Town and, and Long Hill. Um, so completion of that project is, is slated for fall of this year. Um, so we, we're, we're getting closer, a lot's moving, um, tightening the schedules because we're getting closer and closer to that date. Um, then we have the Skiss Creek Connector, uh, which is a design build project, and that has uh, started construction as well. Um, there's a lot of uh, earthwork, uh, uh, tree removal, you know, those type of things for the pathway. Uh, I know they're certainly working right there behind our Skiss Creek area headquarters, our little sub area there, but uh, I went out there the other day and, and looks like that they're uh, turning dirt if, at, the, at the current time. There are some lane closures that are happening on 143 and Route 60 where those are gonna connect, um, really in, in doing some earthwork, mostly is what that is at this point. But um, throughout the project, there will be some lane closures at both of those termini. Um, that is in stages as well, um, as you can see, but um, <clears throat> it, it works out where they're doing the 60 and 143 widening improvements um, April 21, and then the new construction begins May 21, then final paving overlay June of 2022. So uh, pretty pretty quick project um, 
for a new roadway. But you know, the only the only maintenance of traffic is at 60 and 143, so we're able to work uh, uh, pretty consistent. Um, you know, between those two corridors. Uh, plan mix, I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, that has started. Our contractor has started on Monticello with doing some milling and paving. Uh, that is the first route. Uh, from there, they'll be moving over to Centerville Road um, from, um, well, they're going to do two sections of Centerville, the one between Route 5 and Route 5000. Um, and then they got uh, the, the 5,000 to uh, was it Theodore Allen Road. Um, that'll be next on the schedule. And then the contractor is planning to uh, start on 199, uh, which is from College Creek Bridge all the way to Monticello um, after, after Centerville. So. Uh, we will be starting this week in a tree trimming process, um, trimming the trees along uh, 199 for that for that section of paving, um, just so we can get the pavers, the shoulders have kind of kind of encroached in on that portion of 199, a lot like we did with the preceding portion last year. Um, on call pipe rehab. Um, we have a contractor that has uh, been repairing some damaged pipes for us. Um, we've issued 12 task orders, um, and they're moving right along. Um, we are in the process of working out uh, right of entry for um, property over on Route 30, Old Stage, and we'll be doing an outfall pipe replacement with them, um, hopefully in the next four to six weeks, um, based on right of entry. So that's what all we're waiting for. And then uh, some upcoming projects. Uh, we got the four lane, uh, the widening portion of the two lane of Croker Road to four lanes from the library back to Route 60. Um, and that's going to start construction in late 2023. Uh, we have the sidewalks and bikeway on Route 60 uh, from Croker Road to Old Church Road. And that's about a fourth of a mile of. Uh, pedestrian facilities and that'll start construction in late 2022 and then looking at our smart scale upcoming projects um, that's construction of a shared use path that really connects the Long Hill project that we are currently under construction now um, with the opposite side of 199 so it's, it's sort of bridging that between both sides of 199 um, and that project's looked to start in construction in 2024 um, we have done a, a, a quite a few county safety and operational projects um, working with uh, uh, county administration. Um, we are currently doing a signal synchronization project on Route 60 uh, in the Lightfoot area, um, really looking at uh, connectivity and making sure that they're all talking and so you don't get stopped at every one with the red. Um, it's some improvements out there now. I don't know if you'll notice it, um, but there is. But uh, we've put our communication pieces are already up, and now we're just working on a, uh, a, a plan, uh, a timing plan, you know, to synchronize those. Uh, we've had a few traffic studies come in uh, this quarter. Um, first one being uh, the Route 30 speed study. Um, you know, we've implemented that as a 50 mile per hour speed limit um, from, from, it's really the corridor, it's both James City and New Kent, so if, let's just say from Barnesville, is that Farmers? Fieldstone Parkway? Field, no, on the, on the New Kent, Farmers, Farmers Drive, Farmers Drive, from Farmers Drive back to Fieldstone Parkway, so that, that includes both New Kent and James City County. Um, but that those those signs have been implemented and uh, we also have a crosswalk review that came back um, recommending uh, two crosswalks on uh, on old news road um, so we're working to get the uh, the, the curb ramps um, constructed and then we'll do some signage and some markings and stuff of that nature and then the other one was just a stop sign um, on Morgan Drive, two stop signs actually on Morgan Drive, which is a, a road off of uh, Neckerland area. 
Um, so that concludes my quarterly update, and uh, be glad to take any questions or concerns uh, at this time. I just want to thank you, especially I want to let you know I've heard from constituents that are in that Fieldstone area um, heading into Barnesville, and they greatly appreciate um, that speed reduction. There's plenty of flashing lights. It's billboards. It's signs. <laughs> you can't miss it, folks. <laughs> so people are very appreciative. So I don't know if everyone's aware, but every region has their own VDOT representative. We're very blessed to have Mr. Carroll. He's a great advocate for James City County. So thank you for everything you're doing for us. We really appreciate it. And uh, drainage in Tomano. Working it. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One was, uh, I think we, I sent you an email earlier. We, we were looking into the uh, signal, uh, pedestrian signals uh, over in the Newtown area, and we are. And I, and I have an update. Uh, okay. We fixed two of them, and and as I told you, they're hardware hardware issues, and it's okay. really the buttons themselves. So um, they're offline until we can fix the buttons. But two of them have been fixed already. Okay. They're How still working. More, uh, is, uh, I think it was three or four total, or four total? Um, that were that were broken. Broken. Okay. Now, I don't know if it's from use or from malice. I don't know. But um, the other one was the uh, talking about the crosswalks on Old News Road. Where uh, where are they going to be located? Is that uh, one of them is close to the intersection or at the intersection of News and Old News, and then there's one that's a it's not a mid block, but I, I can show you exactly okay. where they're at. I have a, I'll I'll leave the uh, the report with you. Okay, thank you. I apologize if I missed this, but I know we had someone that wrote to us about the synchronization on Monticello, and I've been out there. I've seen several engineers um, on the side looking like they're trying to to work on that. Did you mention that, and I and I missed it? I, if so, I apologize. Yeah, that, that's really just maintenance, but um, there's a few things going on out there in Monticello. Um, we. Quite a few years ago, we, we installed an sync system, which is an adaptive traffic um, monitoring signalization system where they all talk to each other. Um, it counts cars. It, it tries to open up. It opens up small windows, large windows, tries to get as much traffic as it can through the corridor. Um, the problem is that system now, just like every system, um, has become outdated and the hardware is starting to crash, and there is no, we can't, we can't change the controllers without updating the whole system. So what we've done is, and we're working with other districts to try to get some of their leftover hardware um, to, to kind of piecemeal this together, um, but what we're doing is we have a, uh, Christopher Leeds is in our signal engineering section, is running a, um, signal timing plan for that corridor. So when it's all said and done, we're gonna take the NSYNC and put this signal timing plan where it's pretty much, you can depend on it. You know, it's gonna open up um, as you come, go through. You're gonna catch a red, but when you do, it's gonna open up as it goes through to try to get as much traffic through there as now, as we can. Right now, as let's say the, the signal at News and Monticello, that is that went down. We had a, two other signals that went down because of hardware issues. So what we did, we just moved everything down, and so now NSYNC is not working the whole corridor. It's only working the middle section. We kind of compressed it to try to work as much as we can, moving parts here and there. Um, so that will continue, and the others, the others are just on a timing plan. So where you used to kind of hit, hit, go. You kind of stop, and then you'll go through, and then you may hit or go at the end. Um, however, traffic has increased a lot in the past two or three months. Um, even some of the traffic data is, is pre-COVID. So I, I would say that we have rebounded um, pretty much to where we were pre-COVID. Um, so we forget quickly. But that corridor had always been congested, even with the NSYNC system, during the peak hours. So uh, uh, I don't see that getting any better. Okay. Um, the other thing that I had was hopefully, uh, perhaps at your next update, could we get a, um, would it be possible to get an update on statistics at uh, Centerville and 
five since the, the we've made this change to see if we've seen less accidents and then also to see if we've seen an increase in accidents at Monticello and what is that name road Green Springs Way I th or what was it Green, Green Springs Spring? Plantation Green Springs Plantation yes sorry I've got a lot of road names rolling around in my brain um so anyway if we could get that 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 would be um, that's going to be about a six month after. Normally we okay, that's normally fine. we look at it about a year after. We look at a year's worth of data, so you're only going to be looking at a short. I don't mind. I don't mind updating on okay. six months, but I don't know that six months is a trend. Okay. In the well, you know, but but I'll certainly look at the next at the at okay. And you and and understand this too, the data that you know, when you have police reports and stuff of that nature, it takes a little while for it to hit the tread system for where we can pull it. So even when I do it at the next quarter, it's going to be a month and a half to two months prior is going to be a cutoff there. Maybe we should just wait for the year then. That's normally when we okay. do it because at we, least we have 12 we, we months worth of data. We you go through all six. Yeah. All we said That's what we said. We were. I was just hoping to just get a little interim update but i'm fine with waiting I don't mind for a year i'll peek at it okay uh, I'll, I'll peek, peek at, at it. it but but i just really don't you know <laughs> yeah. until you go through all four seasons sure. and all it's hard to really determine any trend and i'd rather get really accurate information so thank you for that i've got a short list mr carroll appreciate you being here today uh, and we had an opportunity to <clears throat> to chat outside in the lobby before the meeting um uh, but uh, appreciate the fact that you, you'll let it let me know when we have a date for this street sweeping, sweeping on Pocahontas, Pocahontas Trail, Route 60 East. Uh, and I, I noticed that uh, one of the residents out there notified me that uh, the um, uh, drainage inlets uh, are also pretty clogged along that curb and gutter section. In, in and, that and, and that's part of the sweeping piece. When we, when they go through, they they clean the the inlets um, as we're doing the curb and gutter sweeping. Great, thank you. And I want, uh, I want to thank you for uh, looking for a creative way to address the problem in the James Terrace area of Route 143, uh, where folks were uh, cutting through Lee um, uh, in order to avoid the traffic light there. And uh, looks looked to me like it was a pretty good solution. Have you, uh, has it been implemented yet? It's going to be part of our plant mix schedule this year. Okay. So really what we did is uh, we will be paving that right, which is a shoulder now, but it's going to turn into a right turn lane. And, and remove the bollards that are there now and the striping, and we're going to stripe it as a right turn lane. We did go out and, and did cores just to make sure it support traffic, and, and it will. Um, so it's really going to be a paving, um, striping, you know, that, that type of thing project. But it's going to be so part of our paving schedule. So when they uh -huh. go in there to start milling and paving that area, when they finish, the right turn lane will be there at that point. Probably sometime this summer then? This time this summer, but it's not in my two-week look ahead, so I right. really, right. I mean, before the end of November. That's right. what and I, I assume can tell you the, at this point. That would be the same for the um, uh, work on uh, Neckaland and yes. uh, the colony and, and Lake Powell Road there. Okay, great. I mean, there's a list of roads there. I just, um, I, know the, I know the order of the first three at this point. Okay. I, I got a schedule, a baseline schedule of how long all of it's going to take. Um, but as for specific yeah. roads and how they do it, we, we allow the contractor for their mobilization purposes. So do you, do you know about what the end date would be, just so that we'd have a sense of when? End of November. End of November, mm -hmm. okay. okay. And, uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't feel like I was doing my job if I didn't uh, uh, point to another area that really does need some attention, which is Rolling Woods neighborhood. Um, uh, and I've talked about that. Yes, yes sir. right. It's one I, I live in. I, we've talked about it a number of times for a number of years. <laughs> we're past the slurry uh, past life, the slurry. life expectancy, and uh, we're ready for some some serious work in there. Because uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll let me pull the CCI, and I'll, we'll have some more discussion. Okay, great. I appreciate that. Uh, the only other thing I, I had that I just wanted to to ask about was uh, uh, on, I've noticed the uh, last couple of. Um, months uh, that on Route 199, if you're coming toward Jamestown Road from Route 5, um, it seems like uh, there are times when even though there's a lot of traffic um, queuing up, uh, the um, green light is very, very short 
only allows about a half a dozen cars through. And I was wondering, is that related to the to the question of how long the queue is on the other side for turns? Um, uh, well, that that signals that signals a little different because it um, it it has a set rate. So every time it something triggers it, whether it's the turn lane or the through lane on 31 or the turn lane on 199. Um, it starts in that process. So, you know, it loads and then it sets priorities. Uh -huh. and, and that's sort of how that is. So as you get more congested uh, and there's more demand from every uh, every loop out there, whether it be right, left, straights, um, it tries to work through the traffic the best it can. Um, sometimes you have, you know, and, and it's, if less traffic on 31 means more cars, I'm going to get through 199. Um, so... The peak hours, the lunchtime hours, is when I see it where it really starts to starts to gather. Um, yeah, but this is really this is on Route 199 itself. Right, that, right. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I know exactly. I know exactly. I came through it. Yeah, and um, I will say that having the permissive lefts have helped with some of that demand for those uh -huh. left-hand turn lanes um, at that intersection. But you know, Scott and I had the same conversation. The traffic. It, it used to be like that pre-COVID. Now it's starting to return like it was pre-COVID. I mean, it used to back all the way up through Route Five. And it, I, I feel you know it's it's, it's not a, a major uh, obstacle. I think we, you know, I've certainly lived in places where sitting through six right. six or seven right, right, right. <laughs> changes the light is not. I, I counted the. I came through there on the way here, which was lunchtime, right. about about twelve thirty, and I was able to get through on the second cycle. So. Um, well, thank you very much for all the uh, information and uh, for the uh, um, work that you've been doing on all these projects. Thank you. I did have one quick question. I'm really not sure. I, I apologize. I should have said something to the staff before. When you make the uh, turn on to Green Springs Plantation Drive, there are three um, cones mm -hmm. out there on the side where it looks like they're, the curbing is – is not matching and I don't know if this is a county thing I don't know if it's a VDOT I don't know if it's the developer but it looks like there's there's an issue can someone just find out whose it is and let me know thank you so well I had I, so you're not aware of I wouldn't be unless okay. it's I mean if it's a maintenance issue if, or okay you know. thank you sorry thank you supervisor no, Hipple. not a problem I only have one and it it, and I talked to John about it, it relates to his neighborhood and um, a couple called me and <clears throat> and I talked to John about it and told him you know that they'd reached out to me and and they knew John was working real hard not to have the slurry and they're from Carolina and they said it's amazing how much difference Carolina streets are too and I said well you're in an older neighborhood and yeah but I still should have good streets and and um, and they said well, you know we know it's been the slurry's been done and all that, and it's past his life expectancy, and that's sort of thing. And they said, you know, maybe two supervisors could work together and push VDOT <laughs> to pave it. So I talked I talk to John, and John's aware I was going to bring this up today, and, and you know, because we try, all of us trying to stay in our own zones. And, and um, but if, you know, we could maybe look at that and, and the potholes and the issues that they have out there in the neighborhood. I did drive through there just to look at it and and see what's going on and and I and like I say I told John you know what I was doing in his area and I've looked at it as well. Um, I, I will let me add to that just a little bit. We do an evaluation every year of all the pavements. Uh, well, we do a, uh, a about a twenty five percent twenty to twenty five percent evaluation every year on the secondary system. But being that we get everything within four years we easily can track, you know, deterioration rates, stuff of that nature. So, so we, we'll, we can forecast a hundred percent every year. Um, being that 25% is actually, you know, evaluated that year. Um, back about four years ago, we did a hundred percent secondary. So we have a pretty good baseline. So it's not like we just picked a number out of the, out of the system. So what we do, we look at load distress, non-load distress. So that's your your fatigue cracking, your potholes, your longitudinal cracks, um, allegation. You know, really ride rideability, those type of things, and come up with a, a pavement rating. 
Um, that rating allows us to kind of set priorities and determine the best way to spend paving dollars. And they are limited, yes. limited paving dollars. Um, we do, as part of that, do windshield reviews where we go out and look at, you know, sections ourselves, um, which may determine that I'm going to pave this subdivision before this one. Even this one has a little bit higher rating. Um, there may be more vehicles per day that travel this in this subdivision. It's more houses, more impact type of thing um, with the limited dollars that we have. Um, I'd love to pave everybody's road. Um, but but I will add that you know we're we're pretty much stuck to an allocation every year, and we try to try to maximize that. Um, some of it too is mobilization of the contractor. If I can take care of um, certain things in certain areas, I don't have a contractor that's over here, and then I got to pay for him to move all the way over here, and then move all the way over here as part of that contract. So I may know that these areas are deficient, but I rather kind of do these areas because I know I'm going to get better pricing for it. Um, but I can say that we we have a process in place um, in, in trying to determine the best way to schedule and manage the pavements in the area. That's for our primary and our secondary systems. What are the chances in that neighborhood? Um, there is only one road in that neighborhood that's actually deficient. Is, um, is that right? <coughs> yeah, but we're talking about the same road, the same neighborhood. Yeah, John. Right, right. Rolling Woods. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh no, 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 no. I, I, that's not the neighborhood I thought you were talking about. Oh no. Yeah, we're talking about Rolling Woods. Okay. Yep. And um, so that I received some letters. That's the reason I thought that's the oh, neighborhood okay. you were uh -huh. referencing. But yeah, I'd have to look to see. I told him I'd look and see where the CCI was for his neighborhood. I, I don't know it right off, but okay. the only reason I knew about all the others was the letters I've received. Yeah, this is the only one that I told John about. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Yeah, we'll yeah. Just and, I, and, I'm on that and I'm familiar Ms. with Ms. Rolling had Woods, some relatives but, that moved into <laughs> but, but I will <laughs> say that you know a lot of that, and 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 Mr. McGlennon and I have had this conversation many times about you know about what that process is and how we determine. So it's not just going out and riding or pressure. I mean, you can pressure me, you know, that get letters, write letters and stuff of that nature. But when it comes down to it, at the end of the day. I really have to use some sort of process to right. evaluate these, to fairly evaluate and try to use the money the best we can Definitely. Um, and, and trying to set some sort of pavement management system. Right. Yeah, and we appreciate all your and, hard and, work. And I'm right. I, like you said, I, throughout the county, if I could pave every subdivision, my job would be a lot easier. Would. <laughs> Everybody would be happy. Yeah. <laughs> For now. And that's what I try to do, but yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks you for your time. Much. All right, next we'll move into number three, which is the 2021 Historical Commission SA contact, contract, contact Awards. And Mr. Phillips, Chairman, welcome, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you. Just here uh, as the chair of the James City County Historical Commission to present this year's SA contest winners, the 2021 uh, SA contest winners. Make sure that they get uh, uh, their certificate. Definitely. So I don't know if all of them are here today, but our third place winner for the 2021 James City County Historical Commission SA Con uh, was a homeschool educated student, uh, Henry Kester. Henry here today. Our second prize winner uh, from Lafayette High School is Aaron Green. Congratulations, Aaron. You did a great job. And last but not least, our winner of this year's James City County uh, Historical Commission essay contest. Uh, was Benjamin Sheriff from Jamestown High.
Thank you, Ben. Thank you. I'd like to congratulate everybody, uh, all the winners today, and all the other folks. We had a great uh, response to this year's contest. Uh, a lot more uh, as we do this every year. We seem to be getting a, a little bit of traction with it. So um, we have a lot of great kids here in James City County uh, with a lot of writing abilities. So we're real pleased to be able to support that. Mr. Mr. Phillips, thank you for your support as well. Just, just ask uh, for the the topics that were covered by the, the three. Uh, the topics. Uh, the third place essay was Benjamin Yule, a champion of education and proprietor of preparation and strategy. Second place was uh, the Battle of Green Springs, and the third place was Madness on the, or first place, excuse me, was Madness on the James, the Battle of Green Spring, and the survival of the Continental Army in Virginia. Mm -hmm. So all James City County local history. Would you like to do a photo with all the board members? Sure, and the, absolutely. Yes, that'd be you guys great. want to come back down? Is there any way to read? Uh, the county has them. Okay. Um, you know, if you just uh, contact John, he's got all of that information. Great. I'd like to read them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Well done, guys. Thank you. All right, next is James City County Telework Program Overview. Mr. T. How you doing today, sir? Well, good. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair Hippel and members of the board, I'd like to give you an overview of James City County's telework program, a bit about what uh, the background is, benefits for both employees and the employer, and our history with telework in the workplace, and then what our policy looks like to make ours a little different and move our workforce to the 21st century. So if I could have the first slide. So when we talk about the benefits for staff being able to work remotely, um, on average, and these are national standards, a person can save 40 minutes daily on a commute, uh, 7,000 a year on transportation, food, clothing, and possible childcare if they telework half the time. One in four employees quit their on-site jobs because of their commute. And then 91% of employees believe working from home promotes a better work-life balance. So then we look at the benefits for us as the employer. We have an increase in productivity, 30 to 35 to 40% more productive than in the office, an increase of about 4.4 overall in outputs. And the reason for this is you'll hear some uh, common colloquial frames such as, office conversation, uh, tele or conversations around the work cooler. So when you're at home, you normally have a cat and possibly something else that might distract you, but you don't have day-to-day -day conversations with your colleagues. Performance, uh, stronger autonomy, um, produce 40% fewer quality defects. Again, that's a lot to do with a less distractive environment. We find as an employer that engagement is higher and overall productivity, and there's a decrease in absenteeism of 41%. You can also imagine that number has a little bit to do with workplace exposures that you don't necessarily have in your home as far as colds and flus, et cetera. Retention, 54% of employees say they would change your job if it offered more workplace flexibility. And that results in an average of 12% reduction in turnover. And profitability, organizations save about 11,000 per year for a part-time telecommuter. And you can imagine that as office space and equipment. One of the features of working from home is the employer does not set up the workplace. That's an expectation of the employee if they choose to work from home. So we, as the employer, are not having to make sure a person has a work chair and all of the other things that typically you would if you outfit an office. 
And more benefits, 71% of remote workers say they're happy in their job compared to 55% who do not. Remote employees work 1.4 more days per month than your on-site workers. 80% of remote workers believe allowing working from home, their employer cares about them. And compared to on-site workers, employees who work from home at least once a month are 24% more likely to report feeling happier and productive in their jobs. So overall program benefits, many people seek jobs. So for us as an employer, we're increasingly competing with employers that offer telework. And again, it shows the employer cares, promotes a work-life balance. Telework broadens our pool of qualified candidates. So a candidate who lives in Richmond that can telework two days a week is much more likely to consider working in our area than if they have to drive here five days a week. Another benefit, there was a brief mention below, uh, it also can be an option for us regarding disability accommodations, being able to work from home. A person normally has the setup that's conducive for them to produce work, and depending on a person's disability, that may be one accommodation we can provide them to help them keep working. And it allows us to hire individuals who live further away. We talked about that. Uh, retirees, interesting option. Uh, folks who retire and maybe want to come back part-time might be interested in one, two days in the office and a day at home, and then they're part-time for the rest and not having to work. So it gives us those flexible arrangements that may be more appealing to someone who's retired but still wants to do some work for us. So we've been operating our telework program in our social service department over the past two years. And because of COVID, and we'll talk a bit about that, we've been operating countywide a telework program when applicable for the past year. Our program is position-based to avoid any potential thought of favoritism. If your position is not identified as being eligible for telework, then it's not an option we can offer. So it is based on the duties outlined when you're hired. Our employees in eligible positions have to meet all performance standards before and during the program. And telework is not an entitlement, it's a benefit. And so we, re we reserve the right to rescind that at any time. So what that looked like for us uh, during COVID in 2020 is it allowed us to increase our social distancing. It allowed staff greater flexibility. As we know, there were several pandemic challenges around things such as child care and care for family members. It teleworked over 75% of their time. We had 99 folks regular teleworking during that point. And during COVID, we had 75% of 170 people working intermittently. So a, close to around 250 positions were able to take advantage of telework. That's out of approximately 1,000. So what we're projecting for fiscal year 22 and beyond is in 21, because of COVID, we had 77 and 162 for the intermittent. And for FY22, uh, JCSA, uh, we anticipate anywhere from 98 for, or they have 98 positions. The county has approximately 950. We project 19 regular teleworkers and 40 intermittent for approximately 1,100 positions. So a little background in our, our area. We surveyed all the localities in Hampton Roads, and there is only one locality that is not going to implement an ongoing telework program. We believe maintaining our ongoing telework is critical to attract and retain our 20th cent, 21st century workforce. And really, this overview is so you can provide us any concerns or feedback regarding telework for James City County. And I'm open to questions or comments from Scott. 
Mr. Chair, members of the board, if I could just comment. My intent with telework is not to have any, well, very few teleworking 100% of their time. That would be the exception and not the rule, maybe one or two or three that has some life circumstance that makes sense for us. I do think that the telework option where folks could have a schedule that is two or three days in the office, the alternating days at home teleworking, that if we don't offer that, it probably doesn't have an effect today, but it does have an effect as we go forward in time as more localities offer it, people become more accustomed, and it makes it harder and harder for us to recruit some of those positions where teleworking does make sense. Social services and talking with Rebecca Venroot, I think it's worked very well there to help her space requirement, which is what drove that. She can really monitor her productivity of her staff, and so I, have, I think we have very good accountability there. During the telework that related to COVID, departments were tasked with keeping up and making sure their staff were in fact producing. And I believe by and large, we were getting more production out of our staff uh, for those that telework. Um, I can't tell you 100% that we didn't have some take advantage of that, but I think that is by far the exception. I really think people gave us more hours and more production at their time at home. So our intent is not to do a whole lot of it. Patrick's numbers were 19 with sort of that permanent schedule and another 40 that sort of do it intermittently. Um, but I do didn't want to get doing that sort of widespread without the board's input and thoughts and making sure we addressed any concerns you had. Questions, concerns? Um, so certainly I, I agree that uh, we have to have a policy uh, in place and that uh, this is an option that uh, we should be uh, looking for uh, ways to implement. But I do think that, you know, while, while I found the um, presentation to be uh, very um, informative, um, it almost exclusively focused on the benefits of telework. And it would have been interesting to see some of the challenges, some of the issues that m might come up. I noticed you, you said that, for instance, uh, that uh, uh, the employee is ex is responsible for providing the um, equipment and and uh, the um, space in which they would be operating. I can imagine circumstances in which, for instance, we might have issues related to uh, the availability of um, uh, adequate computer facilities, and secure computer facilities in particular. Um, that uh, there might be issues related to the need for um, a particular employee, perhaps somebody with a disability, to have a proper office chair that uh, um, will allow them to, to sit at a, in a uh, position for hours on, uh, on end, perhaps. Um, I wonder about questions like um, when you have two employees who are essentially doing the same kind of job, but we but we have a responsibility to make sure that there is somebody available for face-to-face -face interaction with the county's customers, how you determine which of those people might uh, be uh, eligible for it or whether it's an alternating kind of thing. I just, you know, I, um, uh, when we look at national numbers and sort of mix government and business, I think that it obscures some of the day-to-day issues that might arise that, that do require some kind of consideration. Again, I think that it's that you're absolutely right that we need to have a policy, that we want to uh, be uh, uh, flexible and allow for opportunities, but there are going to be a lot of people who are just not going to have this available to them. Uh, and you know, is that a source of friction uh, in, a, in an employee workforce? And finally, just the question of making sure that employees feel that they are part of an organization, that they are part of that culture and uh, have uh, clear um, uh, opportunities to develop uh, kind of esprit de corps, uh, if you will. Um, those are just some of the things that I, th I think would be uh, useful to be thinking about and, and probably uh, through the consideration by a group of work, uh, a group of employees uh, sitting down and talking through some of these issues. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect feedback. I did uh, focus very much on the positive and the benefits. Uh, luckily, we've had approximately two years with the pilot and one year with COVID. And just to clarify, equipment-wise, I was being very broad when I meant that. Uh, we supply the computer equipment because it has to meet certain security standards or it has to be brought in and then that equipment is actually 
checked to make sure it can operate with our system and safety and security. There are going to be case-by-case -case situations that we are going to struggle with. One of the nice parts about the way we've designed the program is we have a home checklist. Part of the home checklist is before you apply to the program, you provide us a statement of whether you have a reasonable setup, because we can't expect that someone sits on their back deck and it remains productive all summer long. So there's certain expectations that come with this as a benefit, not an entitlement. And we will face and have faced those situations where we have to rotate those schedules. But typically, an intermittent schedule is no more than two days a week. So we're, we've been very able to manage that two staff doing the same job can then rotate that around. But I appreciate that because I think we'll still, over time, find some areas, especially around culture and feeling part of the team, where we have to you realize that technology has limits on creating that kind of culture. Oh, okay. um, for me, I, w I would have rather have seen less national statistics and we have COVID that we've probably had this, we, we had, and we, can we get some information about how that went? Um, like real employee, James City County employee information. Um, and I guess, first and foremost, I would want to make sure that the citizens were being served, um, that we have enough people in here, we have enough people answering the phone, you know. Um, a couple of things that stood out was the child care arrangement. I don't, I don't really understand, um, and I, I, I've been working at home these past um, many months, but I don't have children at home any longer. They're in, they're in college now. They still require some type of supervision. <laughs> but um, so I don't understand how, I mean, are, are we saying with the child care piece that your child's at home with you while you're also doing your job? Oh, I can clarify that. That's a great question. The, the presentation was related specifically to our experience over COVID. The program is, it is not a substitute for daycare. So unfortunately, okay. you would not be eligible if you had a child full-time in your home that required care. Now, if you have a high schooler who's virtual learning, one would assume you're able to function for most of the day without, but it is not a preschool or a daycare situation. I'll give a good example of where it's helpful. Daycare is unable to open until 10 o'clock. An employee could telework that particular day for whatever reason, be it that there was a flu outbreak, a coronavirus, they would be able to telework that one day rather than take the whole entire day off. Okay. We have partial telework days. Those are days to recognize some of the day you need to do something personal, but the rest of the day you can log in and work. So it's that flexible arrangement that we're really gearing this towards. Okay. And then, and, and you know, there might be some, some chance for some really innovative stuff too in that, you know, the United States is one of the very few um, civilized countries that requires mothers to come back to work six weeks after a baby is born, um, where other countries give a lot more time off. If there's a possibility of an employee getting some additional time with their newborn who isn't going to be, you know, a, you, know you can feed them and then put them. <laughs> um, they're not, you're not running after them like a toddler. I mean, there might be some, there might be some opportunity as we progress for, for being innovative and, and helping new parents out, which I'm not opposed to at all. But a couple things, supplies, I don't know that it's really fair to say, well, we're going to do this telework policy, but you can't buy your supplies. You can, so you get to do it. I, I, I'm a little e there. And then the other piece was we get more work out of people. Well, is that really fair? I mean, if you're if you're working and you're putting in your hours, then we don't want you to still be putting in your hours at eight o'clock at night. We want you to walk away from that at computer. I mean, and and I've been following some of this through the pandemic, where 
you know, some people are burning out. So you do almost get the opposite because they're not turning off the computers till eight o'clock and then they're getting up at seven o'clock in the morning and they're turning it on. And then let's face it, telecommuting isn't going to work for every department. And so I also don't want to make sure that, you know, um, we are, you know, our first responders, for example, that are sitting out here, you know, they can't, they can't telecommute. They, they got to go. Um, so I just want to make sure that we are considering all of those things as we work through it. Um, but I'm glad we're looking at it and I'm, I'm glad that it sounds, it sounds as though it's working in Rebecca's department and, and has been. So, um, hopefully we can continue to evolve and find some more success. Yeah, Ms. Larson, I, I didn't have Rebecca program to speak, but she certainly could come up at the end if you'd like her to say a few words about what she sees as the pros and cons. I think she'd be happy to do that as well. Any other questions? I've got a few. Um, yeah, first and foremost, I want to make sure that, that we supply what our citizens need. That's our first job of anything we're doing in the county, you know, that, that we make sure that, that we're able – I've, during the pandemic has been very frustrating. I know we had to do what we had to do. And, you know, that, that forced us into isolating ourselves even more than we normally have. A good example, years ago, there was someone retiring in the county. And I asked another employee who had been here for a long time. I said, they've been here 29 years. Do you know who, you know, that person? And we're like, no, never met them. I mean, that's with us being here every day. So with us telecommunicating, there's going to be more of that distance. That's why my thought of putting us in one building so we can have that adds what to way? that. Who opened that door? Yeah, I know. I, that's just, I love those doors. Uh, but, you know, it, it gives us more chance to meet everybody. You know, I think telecommunicating and all that, there's a, there's a, there's a spot for it you know, where it can help with, you know, days here and days there, that sort of thing. I just want to make sure that, you know, you call anything anymore. Now, the biggest frustration I hear from anybody is you call somebody and you're in India talking to Cindy, who's a man who doesn't know anything about what you're talking about. And so you're sitting there going, I just want a person to be able to answer this question right now. I don't have all day to go through all this. I don't, have a, I don't have all day to send an email and wait for a response to come back in tomorrow. And that's what I don't want to see us getting into. And um, some of the other communities are doing that. And in construction, that is extremely frustrating. You can't get an answer, well, I'll be back in the office Tuesday. <laughs> well, I'm working today. I, you know, I, I would like it. Can you give me somebody who can get me an answer? Well, somebody's on vacation or the rest of them are telecommunicating, so you can leave them this. And, and it's, it's very frustrating. I know it's just not me in construction. It's other parts of that as well. We've done very well in James City County to keep that moving, keep that out there. And compared to other communities that I work in, we've done extremely well. On, on getting that out. I just don't want to see us lose that and don't want to see us in an area where, okay, because you're telecommunicating, and some of it was, I don't have that, that's at the office. Well, then your telecommunicating today is absolutely worthless. You should be sitting in your office where you have that information. And and that's what I've gotten, in, in, not in our jurisdiction, but others. And it, it's very frustrating. So I don't want to see us following a trend. I agree with this is this is another thing that we can use in our toolbox. I just don't want to rely on it too much. And then I worry with, um, you know, how come I can telecommunicate and John has to stay in the office? You know, that's not fair. And you know, then all of a sudden, is there an, you know an axe between us? because I'm able to go home and, and John knows at lunchtime I took two hours, but I worked till eight o'clock at night, you know, but it's still like, well, I had to be here. I had to do this. And so I wonder how down the road, and then I wonder down the road would be like, okay, you won't let me telecommunicate, but I have everything you want, but my job may not quite allow me. 
well, I may want to sue you so I can telecommunicate. You know, everybody's doing it across the world. Why can't I do it? James City County doesn't let me as this employee, but let's John do it. That's not fair. And so trying to figure out those things and, and prevent those issues coming up in the, in the longevity and the, the long term, it might be, you know, something we need to look at as well. So just a few thoughts. Yeah, no, and, and I've heard that theme through some of the comments, and I think it's very important. One of the reasons why we we insist it's identified in the job description is the same reason why my job description says I only have to lift 200 pounds, but a firefighter has to lift 100. It's the nature of your job that this position does these things. So it again, it's it's truly not an entitlement and that's why we have to have a policy and a job description to defend why some jobs can do this and others can't. And we have to go through a very detailed process to determine which ones can. And I do. So it's not COVID where we got to do everything right. we can. This is a design program where it's going to meet everybody's needs and this position allows for that. And I do like the fact that this is a benefit like driving, this is a benefit. Yeah. You mess up, take you don't home drive. car privileges. That's it's right. The same idea. Exactly. So I like that part of it. Thank you. Any other questions? I, yes, sir. <clears throat> Pardon me. I was just going to comment. It looks like from the uh, slide here that you're talking about going forward uh, with potentially 19 or 20 regular and uh, 40 intermittent. Uh, so we're looking at about 60 people out of well over a thousand. So total uh, people involved in this process would be about 6%, uh, and the regular ones would be probably about 2% of the, of the workforce. So it's a very small number, and I think as long as it is targeted, like you said, by sp specific uh, job and position, um, that it, uh, it will allow us to serve the public, because I think it comes right back to it, our ability to serve the public is the utmost. Uh, and I think that this has been a benefit to us during COVID because COVID is an unusual circumstance, but it allowed us to keep the doors open and, and, and service the needs of our, our constituents uh, at, during a very difficult trying time. Um, it's going to be a little different going forward, but it's still, I think, if it's done properly, can be very beneficial uh, as long as we ultimately get that uh, job done and, and serve the needs of our constituents as well. So I, I, I think I think they're some good comments that are made, but then, but I think uh, ultimately going forward, it's just something we should probably need to be looking at. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, next we'll move into consent calendar and our consent calendar, I'm not gonna read all of them. It goes from one to 13 and I'll look to the board to see. Oh, before we go into consent calendars and ask for that, let me um, get Mr. Lamb up and if you'll introduce Mr. Otis, to us as well before we get into this part of the consent. And in that way, you know, we'll know what we're talking about. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, several months ago, I had the privilege to stand before you and introduce uh, Assistant Fire Marshal Jared Randall when he completed all the requirements for the position. Today, I get the, the honor to do it again. Uh, this is Nathan Otis. He's been with James City County Fire Department for over 15 years. Uh, in late fall, he accepted a position into the fire marshal's office and has recently, as of about two weeks ago, graduated from the Law Enforcement Academy and uh, has met all the requirements needed for appointment and authorization of his police and fire prevention powers. So we uh, hope that you guys will consider that and uh, allow us to do. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you. All right, now I'll go into the consent calendar in 1 2 13 and look if there's any that any member wishes to pull at this time. I would like to pull number 11. Number 11? Yes, sir. Okay. But with that, I'll move the rest of the items on the consent. Okay. All right. Mr. Stevens, you call the roll, please, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. Motion carries. All right, now we'll look to. Number sure. 11? Sure. So uh, about a year ago, I was contacted by a citizen who lives at 111 Spring Road um, in the Kingswood subdivision. There, the, right next to uh, <laughs> this gentleman's house, um, between he and 113, is a 
street. Uh, be hard pressed to call it really a road, but it is a street. And that, in that street is the Kingswood Pool. Um, and they were given the address when it was built of 111A. And as the years have gone by, there has been considerable confusion. Uh, this gentleman at 111 uh, receives, he does receive pizza orders for them um, <laughs> at late in the evening and um, some, you know, all hours of the day. But that really, his concern was um, he was worried about first responders. Both he and his wife are, are elderly. Um, they've had to call on James City County before. I do want to give credit, though. Our, our first responders have gotten there. But um, the, it, they've gotten packages delivered. And, you know, the pool's not open when the time of the packages come. They're not in a position to get the packages to the pool. So it has been a real problem. He, he requested a year ago that that road be given a name. And so we've been working. We've, we've hit a couple of, um, we hit a couple of um, uh, hiccups. It, it says in here that West Kings would drive to the new, but when I first started down this path, um, no pun intended, I asked if th this road, is there is no name. That's why they're 111A at the pool. They, they're not West Kingswood um, Drive. We discussed today that possibly being a road, but the county administrator um, was reluctant to do that or to, um, to back that splitting off of there is a West Kingswood, but splitting it away from that, especially with the pool involved, we know that our uh, fire department or police department would get there, but it would just make it a little bit more confusing. So, all of that to say, I would like your approval for one, to, to name that road Red Maple um, Place. Red Maple Place. Um, and, and Ask a question about it. You can. 111, <laughs> the, the individual who was concerned, is, is, was his address still be the old um, he will stay, his address will stay Spring Road. So the only one that would become is the pool. The, is the pool. So this, the pool would be the only address on this new street. Correct. Solves the problem. Thank you. Yes. The only, that's the only address impacted. Oh, that's all your hard work and your recommendation. <laughs> yes. Well, and staff, I have to say, has worked hard too. They've taken some, there, there was some, some, uh, we didn't uh -huh. all match up over the last few <laughs> weeks, uh, but we, we've matched up today, and in our very hurried way today, we found Red Maple Place. So, Is there a red maple there? We'll plant one. <laughs> Don't make it. There will be by 4 o'clock this afternoon. In the rain. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but anyway, so that's my recommendation. All right. So. We have a recommendation. So, Ms. Larson, the, I think it would be a motion to approve the resolution with the amendment from uh, Clam Court to Red Maple Place. Okay. Yes, that would be my recommendation. Okay. Or my, is that right? Yes. All right. All right. Roll call, please, sir. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Any board discussions or board considerations at this time? Or oh, board requests and direct us. I'm good to Roll them all Thank up you. together. <laughs> um, I, I did just wanted to say uh, on June 12th, we went out to uh, Peg Borman's uh, Clean County Commission picnic, and it was uh, 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 highly successful. They had had a beautiful weather and, and uh, good food and uh, a pretty good turnout out there. And I know uh, John McGlennon and I were there, but uh, uh, I really uh, enjoyed that, um, especially since the a uh, young uh, lady who won their uh, essay contest uh, and won the scholarship uh, was there to receive it with her parents, and uh, she, it was, she was a, a very delightful young lady. Um, and we all, or most of us, I think, uh, had a chance to come out to the Juneteenth uh, celebration at, at uh, Freedom Park. That was uh, very impressive, and I want to thank the county staff for really putting on a superb uh, event. Um, and then uh, I had one uh, Hampton Roads Transportation uh, uh, HRTPO. We had a special meeting and we finally passed the 2045 long range transportation plan 
it's finally done. It's just been taken forever, but it's all all done. So that's all I had. No, okay, good. I didn't want to jump in front of you. No, thank you. Uh, just wanted, there is a triathlon out uh, at Chickahominy Riverfront Park this weekend, so there will be traffic impact on Thursday and Friday. And I also believe they are still looking for volunteers. If anybody is interested in, um, they, they still need um, some lifeguards, uh, and it, this is paid. Is it, the compensation is um, for lifeguards is they paid. They need some bike leads. They need some Sunday park parking directors. They need some help with kayaking. So if anybody's interested, you can shoot me an email, and I, I can send you the um, link to volunteer. So thank you for that. Um, and I just just a slight. Um, you know, how's it, the housing market around here seems to be doing quite well. I don't know if we've hit a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a lull or not, but I know it's been very, very busy this year. And just a suggestion to really pay attention to where you're moving into a neighborhood. If having an HOA is important to you, please move into a neighborhood with an HOA. Um, if not, and, and understand what that means if you move into a neighborhood without an HOA. Um, if you buy a business, I know that sometimes people will contact me. They're very aggravated. They're very aggravated with me. They're aggravated with staff. They can't do something on their business. But they purchased a business that was zoned a certain way. And if you're going to purchase something, you know, the, the staff is very willing to talk with you to tell you what is allowed, what is not allowed. Um, and the same in, in neighborhoods, know what, try to know what is around you, if there's undeveloped land around you. Now, I realize that we can make a decision up at this dais that might change zoning at some point. So, you know, that's another reason to, to stay engaged with what's happening at your, um, at your loca in your locality. But really pay attention to to your neighborhood um, before you buy and, and really try to make a decision about what type of neighborhood that you want to be in as far as um, HOAs, non-HOAs, and, and what, the, um, re what the recourse is of, of those things. I, I think, if, I know that that's one thing I've learned since being here is to really pay attention to what's allowed, what's not allowed. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I got a couple items and, I, and um we're not in any rush to get out into the rain, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me just make a couple of mentions of them. Um, this is graduation season, and so uh, I attended the uh, GED graduation ceremony, which is always uh, very inspiring because it suggests that uh, here are some uh, typically young people who have uh, um, at one point or another left the traditional path to a high school diploma but have decided that they are going to make it um, – uh, priority to do the hard work of getting back on track and receiving that uh, general equivalency diploma. And so uh, I want to congratulate both the classes of 2020 and 2021 who received certificates uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I attended the Lafayette uh, and Warhill High School graduations last Friday. It was a little toasty out there, but it was uh, <laughs> certainly great to see everybody uh, um, receive their degrees, and it, it was wonderful that families could be there to uh, to celebrate with their graduates. I uh, was unable to attend this year's Jamestown High School graduation, but uh, uh, I know it was successful as well. Um, uh, speaking of schools, um, Mr. Stevens and I were both at uh, the um, uh, unveiling of the new electric school bus uh, buses that uh, uh, our school system uh, has received as part of a project in uh, conjunction with Dominion Power and uh, Sunny Merriman uh, uh, Bus Company, uh, and uh, it was really very interesting to take a ride on the on the buses. Uh, I don't. Uh, I, Mr. Stevens was asking a lot of questions, uh, betraying his engineering background. Um, uh, <laughs> so he may have something else to say about this, but uh, I just thought it was uh, uh, terrific, not only from the perspective of the uh, environmental quality of these buses, the, the um, very quiet uh, ride that you would experience, uh, uh, but also this, uh, uh, not only on the electric school buses, but other school buses, the new safety uh, uh, 
equipment that is being put on board to make uh, students and, and uh, uh, those who are there to see them off the buses uh, feel safe and, and uh, comfortable walking across the street. Uh, also attended the Juneteenth celebration, which I, I agree with uh, Mr. Eisenhower was it was exceptionally well done. I congratulate the uh, the committee that uh, worked hard on that uh, and saw it this year as a substitute for uh, the Black History Month celebration. Uh, but uh, I think we'll see both of those next year and, and going forward, and it'll be a great addition. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, with Mr. Eisenhower, I attended the. Uh, uh, annual picnic uh, celebrating Will Barnes, uh, who was a great volunteer for our uh, Clean County Commission over the years and was responsible for, uh, as a volunteer, organizing a project that resulted in the planting of about 100,000 tree saplings along Route 199 uh, to help screen uh, that road from uh, the neighborhoods adjoining it. Uh, and finally, um, I attended a virtual meeting of the Hampton Roads uh, Workforce Boards. Uh, it's a combination of both the, uh, the South Side and Peninsula Workforce uh, Boards that has been in work uh, in the works for a long time, it will take effect on July 1st. Uh, but it was also the last meeting uh, for Bill Mann, who has been the Executive Director of the Greater Peninsula Workforce Board. Uh, he's done a wonderful job uh, over the years uh, in helping to provide opportunities for people to get training that allows them to uh, uh, um, get certi certified to uh, hold uh, well-paying jobs uh, and uh, help meet some of the workforce needs of, of uh, industry in our communities. Uh, and uh, he also was, played a leading role in helping us to develop the one-stop shop that will be opening at Thomas Nelson Community College. Uh, uh, Bill's uh, last major uh, action, of course, was playing a, a preeminent role in the merging of the workforce boards on the peninsula and south side, and I think we'll see some real benefits from that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the indulgence. Thank you. The, um, it's amazing as you, as, as you sit in this board and, and watch some of the leaders start stepping down and all the quality and everything else that they put in our community and our region, it's amazing that, that you know, you're always hoping that the new ones that are taking their positions will not only do the job that they did, but also lead us in new ways and new directions and new um, concepts as we, as we move forward. So hats off to all the older men and women who have led the county and done the jobs that, that the new ones are taking over because it's a, it, it's a big lift. We had the um, HR TAC meeting um everything went well and all that and a budget meeting as well on that so there was a lot of number crunching thought we could get it done in two hours and we went a little over that but um we took care of a lot of budgeted items that had to do with the hanford rose bridge tunnel um i passed the gavel over to mayor west on harumpha so as chairman of harumpha i ended my two-year stint and that's all you can do on any of those a two-year stint as uh, um chair so um mayor west takes that over and and i wish him well and and i was allowed to i told him i said well i'll i'll let you gavel the meeting out and he said well i'm already gonna be a um a hit as being chairman when i get to gavel a meeting out ahead of time so his great man does it will do a wonderful job for us um went to talk a little bit on the radio station as all of us do and um Talked about the comp plan and getting involved and trying to get the um, citizens involved prior to getting up here to us to make decisions. And um, talked a lot about how you need to, you know, this has been going on for 18 months or better, how you need to get involved in some of these things. I like get more citizens involved in the groundwork and what they're seeing and what our citizens are asking for, for these different projects and and the different um, plans and the different directions that give us the direction to move the county forward to make our decisions. And the more citizens we get involved, the more um, ability we have to make uh, the decisions that we know the citizens of the county from all walks of life want. So, you know, just encouraging more um, citizen input on all of our boards and commissions. And uh, next, I'll turn it over to a report from the county administrator. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll be brief. I, I really just want to say thank you to you and the Board of Supervisors for your support and guidance over the past several years. 
Um, I appreciate your willingness to extend my contract an additional five years and look forward to serving the community. Uh, you're working with our employees, working with you to serve the residents of James City County has really been extremely rewarding. Uh, I've been thoroughly enjoyed that. And I'd also like to share uh, with you and the community that Monique and I have closed on a home last week and we're excited to remain in James City County, at least for uh, the foreseeable future at this point. So again, thank you a lot for confidence and anything to do to support you or the community or our employees, I would just ask folks to reach out to me and happy to help with that. So thank you. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right, next I'll move into a closed session. To, uh, look for a motion to move into a closed session for consideration of personal matter appointments of individuals to county boards and, and or commissions pursuing a section 2.2-3711A1 of the Code of Virginia. Motion. Motion. Roll call, please, sir. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. We're in closed session.
items we indicated we would speak about in closed session. Thank you. Roll call, please, sir. Ms. Sadler. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. McGlennon. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Mr. Garris. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move the following nominations uh, to the Historical Commission. Uh, I'd like to move the reappointment of Fred Bolt and uh, Russell Henke uh, for terms which would expire on June 30th, 2024, and then appoint uh, Mr. Michael Routh to a one-year term through June 30th, 2022, Mr. Christopher McDonald uh, to a uh, two-year term, which would extend to June 30th, 2023, uh, Melissa Butler, Heath Richardson, and Bruce Schock to three-year terms that would extend to June 30th, 2024. Uh, to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, we have had a resignation, so for the remainder of, uh, of a term that would expire on April 30th, uh, 2022, I would uh, nominate uh, Ivan Tab uh, for the uh, Thomas Nelson Community College Board, nominate uh, uh, Scott Van Voorhees for reappointment, uh, and for the WADA Board of Directors uh, staff appointment, uh, nominate Paul Holt to continue in that to June 30th, 2025, and finally uh, to for the uh, Peninsula Alcohol Safety Action Program uh, would nominate uh, Monique Myers Perry to represent the county uh, for a term that would begin on July 1st, 2021, and expire on June 30th, 2024. Thank you. All right, roll call, please. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Next, we're looking in the J for an adjournment until 5 p.m. on July 13th, 2021, for a regular meeting. Motion. Have a motion. motion. Roll call, please, sir. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Motion carries. We're adjourned.